Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this week's Quick Tip, where I'm going to take you up on a promise to look at one of my After Effects comp files, and therefore the workflow I constantly use within After Effects to get my CGI done. It's very similar to the Fusion video, if you've seen that, but it's good to know that in detail. So let's grab your coffee and let's keep going. What we are going to do today is take last week's scene and instead of internal compositing it in Octane, the video is in the upper right corner right now, we are going to split out the light passes and use them to comp that externally in After Effects using my usual workflow. We are using the newest After Effects version as this allows us to bring all the passes together within OpenColor.io with Aces. So I show you all the steps I usually do within my compositing here and then export it through Media Encoder, which is new and now works within an ACES workflow. So let's buckle up and let's keep going. To start with, you are probably aware that I'm using EXR and a linear workflow in my scenes. So also there's multiple ways to get your scene files or your renders inside of compositing the most easy way would be to save it through Cinema 4D and then open it in comp and then just add a color correction. But I want to be more in-depth, I want to have more flexibility, so what I usually do is go to my AUV manager here and separate all the lights within new Octane. There's even 20 different light passes you can use now. To put your lights in the right path, there is the tedious way of going to the light. So let's search one, here we go, environment and then light. Hit on the tag and then we can set the path here. Or there's an easy way, you can go to the VIP Octane Light Manager and drag your lights in the way in the path you want it to be. And therefore you get the right association. Now let's move this slide back here and then go to the output here real quick. So I usually output through Octane's output, not the Cinema 4D one here. You can see the tick is turned off because Octane is doing a really good job in managing its own passes. So I'm always going here and using render tokens to export the single frames or animations depending on what I'm doing. What's really important for a multi-light workflow is that you export in a floating point format such as EXR and it is 16 or 32 bit float. And you have to remember that with EXR everything is float. So if I set it to 16, this is not a 16 bit integer like in PNG. This will be a 16 bit float. Then the compression is DWAB. I like that one because it gives very small images and they retain all the data that you need. It's a lossy format, you need to know that, but I never had problems comping with it. Okay, last two points before we jump into comp. So one is I don't like multi-layer files. I like my files separated. It's just a personal preference. I just don't like to deal with more complex scene files that the multi-layer file is giving us. And then last, with almost all my newer projects, I export in a color space of Asus CG to have the information available if I need them. And our comp in After Effects will be Asus CG also. So now that we've set up our light passes here, let's head over to After Effects and bring them in and go through my workflow. We start with a fresh After Effects scene. So first of all, let's make this work with OpenColor.io or Aces. So let's go and click here and set this to OpenColor.io Color Managed. Then yes, we want to do that. And maybe go with the CG version of the Aces. So we are going with a scene linear Aces CG. When it comes to color space, this is a very important chapter as this lets you see through the viewport what you're going to end up with in the end. So the preset sRGB transform is very contrasty and also rather dark, so I don't like it that much. And as you know me, I much rather prefer the Rec. 709 version as it has less contrast but also has a very nice tone mapping. So let's choose this one. 
And this is everything set up, so let's bring in the files. Let's bring in our image sequences. Now in After Effects, this is a bit of a tedious task. So if you double click on your project, you open up the folder that's containing the files, and then you have to import every one of those sequences individually. Now, if you know a better way than that, please let me know. To import image sequences, I really like the detailed view. Did you know that there's actually a shortcut on your keyboard? So what you can do is control shift and hit six on the number row, not the numpad, and this brings you to detail view. Now you can't see all of it here, but there's also a shortcut for that and you hit control and plus, and this extends the namespace so you can read it all. Isn't that nice? Also, what's noteworthy is that you can click every file within a sequence and After Effects will load the sequence with the right range. As a next step, what's really important is that we interpret the colors of our footage right. So let's go here and interpret footage and main and then go to color. Because for some reason After Effects always interprets them as ACES 2065-1 and we want to have a ACES CG file. Since we are setting up the output in our 3D program in the color space as ACES CG. So we want to match our output here. So make sure this is ACES DG and then go yes, okay. Then what we need to do is go interpret footage, remember interpretation on the file we just set, select all the others and then interpret footage, apply interpretation. And this applies the right color space then to all the other files here that we imported. So next, let's actually create our comp and I intentionally imported the main, which is our beauty. So let's drag that in our comp here, new comp, and therefore create a new composition. Now you can see, because we are going through ACES, we have a look transform here. And if we go to non, this is the linear file the compositor sees, but we are going to look through a file conversion that is going to give us the right colors and the right brightness. Now, here's also the sRGB version that I deemed too dark and too contrasty. So let's have a look at this. And yes, you can see this is a too contrasty look for my taste. So I'm going with the Rec 709 version, which gives us the same color treatment in terms of highlights, but doesn't treat the contrast in the darker tones too harshly and can dial in the contrast to our own personal preference instead of letting the ACES sRGB tone mapper decide what is good for us or not. Also, something you shouldn't forget is to save your project. So if it crashes, you can start from that point. So let's do this real quick and let's go here and let's save that as tutorial. Here we go. What I want to do next is bring in our light passes to be compared with the main or the beauty pass. So let's go here and grab them all and put them atop of the beauty right now and also invert their range here because this is a personal preference. I like it that way. Here we go. Next, let's grab all of them but the environment light or the most bottom part of here and add them together then bring our main pass to the top and then toggle it on and off. And you can see it's a perfect match. So we did everything right until now with our process. Small explainer portion. So if you are not into technical details, let's jump into the next chapter. But for those who are interested, there are two reasons why our math here is working. And the first reason is that our underlying comp is linear. So the math that supports the light is not distorted by a gamma or other functions. And the second reason is that we are working in floating point. That means our XRs can save higher values than one. So if we move our mouse to a very bright point, you can see in the info box here that we have very high values. So 4.5 times as bright as the display would be able to handle. So basically the real world light data that has been rendered is encoded into the files without any loss. 
and therefore we can layer it upon each other, add it together and get the exact same result. This wouldn't be possible with an 8-bit TIFF or a 16-bit PNG for example, as it misses the floating point values and most likely is not stored linearly. So let's set this back to our Rack 709 and go to the next chapter. Okay, let's continue. First of all, we want to delete the main pass since we don't need that anymore as we have verified that all the other passes match up to the main pass. Next, what I want to do is go to the post pass and bring that in and also add that on top. So we have everything layered on top what we need for our final comp. So the reason we split up every light into its own pass is that we now have full control of every light. And this is the real strength of the later on compositing step. So what we are able to do now is, for example, if the environment light is too strong, we can turn it off completely, of course, but also we can dial in the strength, either by hitting T and going with the percentage of visibility, or what is a more accurate way, going with an exposure. So I have Andrew Kramer's effects console installed, so I hit control and space and type in exposure. Here we go. So what we can do now is control the exposure, make it brighter, make it darker, and dial in the exact right amount that fits our needs or our vision. If you explored the scene in 3D, and yes, you can own the scene by becoming a patron, you might have noticed that I split up the light between the lighting on the most other objects and then the lighting on the metal objects here. I did that on purpose, obviously, because I wanted to have control on how shiny those metal parts are. So what we can do with it is go to the metal parts here and add another effects console exposure and then turn down the exposure to not overdo it with the shininess of the metal. For example, to minus 1.25. Here we go, I like round numbers. This is of course something that is best done or thought about beforehand before you render since it is rather hard to pull masks around objects in After Effects like this. What I usually do next is bring in an adjustment layer. So let's go to Layer and New. But since solids and adjustment layers are the same, I usually go for a solid. And then I just use that, whatever After Effects names it. Now let's go and bring that to the top here. And to make it an adjustment layer, let's actually click that button here. Now, the real cool thing is that solids and adjustment layers are basically the same. And I use the same solid for everything I need, so the interface doesn't get cluttered. To help us to know what we are doing, let's actually rename the layer itself to color correction, because this is what it is. Inside of there, I want to add curves. So let's go with curves. Here we go. And what I want to do here is bring in some color variation. So sometimes the shots are looking very one colored. So this, for example, is very warm. So if I wanted to make it a little bit colder, what I would do is go to the red channel, pull it down a little bit, and then go to the blue channel and pull it up a little bit. So now the shot is more neutral. This might not be what I want, but just to let you see what I usually do. Now in color correction, there is this rule that you never should touch green. You always should touch red and blue and green is the static channel. You can do as you like. It's just a small rule to not distort the curves of your image too much. Let's actually dial in the curves here to make them a little bit more warm, but not as warm as they have been before. Something like that, maybe. What I also want to do here is give the image a little bit more contrast. And yes, I know I could just use the sRGB curves here, but I want to give it the contrast I want and not the contrast that is predefined. So let's duplicate the curves here by hitting Ctrl D and then reset the curves too, then dial in some contrast here. 
Now, remember what the renderer or the comp program is seeing is very dark. So we need to adjust the contrast further down here because let's go and try to get the middle tones adjusted. And you can see most what we adjust are the highlights here. So let's go further down here and adjust our contrast down here. Something like that. Maybe that's a little bit too contrasty. And if you're feeling you lack control, you can obviously increase the size of the curves here to get more into the detail of what you're doing. So let's go back and actually make it smaller again. And let's fiddle around here a little bit. So not, not a lot is going up here, but let's try to get it somewhere like here. So this is looking kind of all right. To state the obvious, you are not reliant on an adjustment layer getting the colors right. Obviously, you can do that on a layer by layer basis. So what I'm going to do here is get to the projection of the light, which has its own light path, and therefore get a little bit more saturation and oomph into it. So again, I'm calling my favorite effect, which is cursed. Here we go. And then go into the red curve here and just increase it a little bit. And you can see now the rim of the light has a slightly reddish halo, which is looking a bit more spicy to me. I like it. And of course, in the same manner, you can do adjustments to every one of your layers. What I'm almost always doing and what we also did in last week's tutorial with the internal compositing of Octane is a vignette. So let's go for a vignette by dragging in the black solid here one more time. Here we go. Let's make it the topmost layer. And to make it a vignette, we are going to use the ellipse tool here. Now you can double click the ellipse tool to get an ellipse here, but we are going to get a round shape. So let's just click the ellipse tool, go in the middle here and click hold shift and control to make it a circle. And now we have a mask that is in a circular shape. So if you're not using a anamorphotic lens, then we usually have a circular vignette, not a oval one. To make this work, let's twirl open the mask here. Let's go to subtract. You can also work with the inverted version here. And then what we have here is a big circle. So we want to feather the hell out of our mask. So let's go with a feather of 1000. And this makes the edge really dark, but the middle isn't affected as the circular circumference is quite large. So what we want to do is go to the mask expansion and let's go with a minus 250, for example. Here we go. Now our edges are extremely dark. So let's hit the object layer here. Let's hit T for transparency or opacity. And let's make this around 40. So if we toggle that on and off and let's make our mask disappear here, we can see now we have a nice vignette going. And for this, last but not least, let's call our layer vignette. Here we go. As a last bit in this session of our comp, this is not something I do regularly, but in this case, I want to have a sharpness fall off towards the rim of the image. So what I'm going to do is copy our vignette here, and let's go to the comp section here and create a new composition. Make sure it's the same dimension as well as the same length. Remember, we are dealing with an animation here. And let's paste that in here. Also, what we are going to do is go to the transparency. So hit T and make it 100%. And then bring in the black solid one more time and go for the effects console here and hit tint and then we are tinting it white. So this is a good trick for not using multiple solids and also keep your comp very clean. Here we go, let's call this white and this can be our vignette, this is okay. So the only difference I want to make here is go MM 
to reveal our mask properties and then go and set this to maybe 750 to have the fall off more on the rim and not reaching inward in the image too much. So let's close this all down by hitting U and then go back into our main comp here. Uh, here we go. And what we are going to do is bring in our comp. Let's name that also and go for edge blur. Here we go. And bring that in as the last layer in here. We can even make it invisible. Now, once more, we drag in a black layer. Let's drag it into between the layers and the first color correction here and make it an adjustment layer and then call it edge blur also. Inside of there, we're going to make a lens effect. And we are going to go with a camera lens blur. Here we go. Now, inside of the camera lens blur, we want to get the edge blur. And that should do it basically. So let's see what we're doing. Yes, you can see it's working, but you can also see that we are blurring the inside of our image and the rim is sharp. So exactly the opposite of what we are trying to do. So fortunately there is an invert here. So we can invert the mask. Also what you can see is that our highlights here are hexagonal and we want to have them round. So let's get the roundness up to 100%. And obviously this is a little bit strong. So we are going with a blur radius of maybe five to not make it too obvious. Maybe 7.5 is good. Let's leave it at that for now. Just to explain, with our edge blur map, we are basically created a set depth mask, which we are using to create a set depth blur but the set depth blur is not dependent on our scene, but rather on the distance from the center of our scene. So we are blurring the edges of our frame, which mimics older lenses and has a really nice look to it, especially if we are using that for something as nostalgic as this scene we are dealing with right now. All right, let's say we are done with all of our tweaking and want to proceed to the next step, which is adding a little bit of chromatic aberration to our scene. And this is what I do with almost all of my scenes. It is just a question of how strong it should be. So let's go to our main comp here and let's rename it to bulb01 here and then take the whole comp and make a new comp out of it. So basically this is now a folder in which all of our settings that we've done before live in. So on the folder, we also can apply effects. So let's actually do that and let's call for the shift channels. Here we go, shift channels. And then before we do anything in the effect, let's duplicate our comp two times by hitting control D. Here we go. And what we're going to do is separate our channels, red, green, and blue into different comps. So let's do this with the first here and go red, full off, full off, so we only end up with the red channel. And then we are going to do that here with the green channel. And in our last comp, obviously with our blue channel. Now, when we turn on everything again and then add them together, you are ending up with the image that you started with. But now what we can do, if I zoom in and go to the edge here and then go to the scale by hitting S, and then slowly scaling that up, you can see now we can add some chromatic aberration. And since we are scaling, the scale in the middle isn't very strong. It gets stronger the more it moves to the rim. And therefore we are getting a really naturalistic way of adding chromatic aberration. By scaling different channels, you can get different results but I usually like to just scale the red channel as this gives me the blue-green chromatic aberration that is very common in all sorts of lenses. Also be careful to not scale in the negative direction or less than 100 as this can leave a gap on the image outer parts since you are shrinking down the image therefore. So let's go with 100 and let's call this good for now.
We are almost at the end. The last thing is a little bit longer and a little bit more complicated though. So first of all, let's clean up the scene by hitting U and then go ahead and make the same thing again. Take our whole comp and create another one from that. Now we have layered that in a new comp as well. This is the layer we are going to output from through our media encoder. So we first have to deal with the color signs. What I mean by that is our system sees this right now. And this is also what our media encoder would see if we not telling the system to convert the pixels. Because this look here, this is just for the view so we can see the colors in the way we need to see them. To apply this to the pixels, we are going to our image layer here and hit the effects console control space again and then type in open color IO or OCIO. And with After Effects 2024, there is this new display transform. So let's hit that. And this gives us our new display transform. And this is exactly the same settings that we set in the beginning of our tutorial. So we have the right settings set up here. We are seeing the image brightened up. This is because we are doing that twice now. Once in the comp and once for our view. So now for our view, we don't need that anymore and we get our old look back. Small word of caution here, there are still some bugs left in the exporter or in the export process that are quite nasty, but I'm going to take your hand and walk you through it so you are ending up with the exact same result as we are seeing here on your screen right now. But let's show you the bug first. Let's go to the image here, make it active and go Control alt m to bring up the media encoder. Now I've started media encoder before, so it gets faster. And then we go and see what media encoder thinks the image should look like. And this is unfortunately nothing like our image. So there's a gamma that is on top of our image. And also we are getting the wrong colors, sort of. Now, if your image is looking great and looking exactly like your viewport in After Effects, then you're good to go. For the rest of you, let's go and get this fixed. So let's cancel that and let's delete that and let's go back into After Effects. It took me a really long time to realize what's going on and the crux is that what we need to set up is not even in the exposed UI here. So what we actually need to do is go to our OpenColor.io settings here and set them back to Adobe Color Managed. Yes, we want to do that. And basically the problems are those both ticks here, or at least the linearized tick up here. So what we need to do is to expose them and we need to get, so for example, a color profile like sRGB, any color profile would do. Then we need to untick them. Then we need to go back to none. Then we need to make sure that this is going to be set to rec 709. And once we've done all that, we need to click OK to activate it once. So this is crying about some errors. We don't want that. So once we have activated it once, let's go back to the OpenColor.io settings and let's go back to our old settings here. So yes, those are OK. So basically, this will enable our OpenColor.io here again. So we have to go back to none. This is not for the export. This would export just fine without that but we want to see the difference here. So let's go Control alt m one more time. And now if we go inside of our media encoder, finally, we have the right result. I think this is a massive bug that can lead to vastly different colors from your output than what you had in comp. And hopefully someone of Adobe is listening to that and can fix that. That would be so super nice. Thank you. Now we could end this tutorial right here, but usually there's some more things that I used to do to my output. So let's go back to After Effects and have a look at this. This is also a very good point to bring up that after the conversion, you no longer have access to brighter than white values, as well as your image is no longer linear. This means that effects that rely on that should be placed before the conversion, obviously but we can also take advantage of that and place effects that not relying on those afterwards. 
such as 8 or 16 bit effects, as our grain in the next example. Also, what's going on when we tone map things is that portions of our image that should be white are slightly grayish. So after the conversion, we can bring them up again. So let's do this by going to our black layer here and bring it in one more time. And of course, again, make it an adjustment layer. So then what we can do is call this After Effects because it comes after the conversion, get it? So what I want to do is go to the Effects Console once more and give it a Levels effect. Here we go. So what we could do is make the contrast a little bit more steep here. So let's go with 0.95 in the gamma. And then with the input white here, let's go with 0.95 to push the lightness of the white values here a little bit higher. So just a little correction here before and after barely noticeable. Now the star of our effect here is the grain that we want to add. So let's go again, grain, here we go. And we want to add grain. Now we want to also get this from preview to final output. And this is very necessary, especially if you encode that later for YouTube or any other codec, so to speak, because someone told me once, and this is a very good explanation, that the codec has to have something to hold on to. And if we zoom in here, you can see the grain is providing that to the codec. Now, this is very strong. So there's a couple of adjustments I want to make. For example, the intensity. Let's go to 0.1, for example. Let's make it rather subtle. And then the size, let's make it 0.5. And then last but not least, the color. I don't want to have colored noise here. So let's go with the saturation 0.25. Here we go. Maybe it's a little bit too weak. So let's go with 0.15 here. Yep, that's better. Also, that really depends on your taste and what you're going to do with it later. And now with those adjustments, we can activate our image here once more. Go with Control Alt M. Go and see if everything looks as expected. Yes, it does. So now we are ready to export our image sequence and therefore we get exactly the output we opted for. So this was it. I hope you liked it and learned something and could gather a lot more knowledge through it. At least some more minor details as some small tips. I want to thank those people who made this video possible, which are my patrons, especially those 50 Euro T subscribers, Shields Augustinen and Leon Studio TV. Also a huge thanks for my 15 Euro T subscribers, AB Studio, Alexander Stevanovic, Alessio De Vecchi, Alex Wilson, Anton, Bavana, BVR, Christian Grajewski, Computer Generated, Eduardo Vicietti, Etienne Schmidt, George Luna, Harish Pavaskar, Jakob Fung, Joy Ciccoline, Just a Frickin, Chris Clemson, Ludger, Marty Kane, Part 1 of 2, Koak Andang, Raiko, Render King aka Alessandro Bonkyo, Reshock, Rory H, Sin CGI, Shamos Johnson, Terry Wayne Ranson, Yasin Rupp, and Shibu Shang. Thank you so very much for all of you for your massive contribution. It really means a lot to me. And as always, if you're still with me, if you're still listening and watching, thank you so much again. So let's post a frame emoticon in the comments for a compositing frame, obviously. And with that, I say, have the most fantastic week and happy layering. Bye.